uh, we'll be in Colossians 3. Uh, this is going to be our final message in our Set Free series. Um, you know, when I, uh, when I went to work as a high school student, first job I ever had was landscaping. I really enjoyed it. liked to work with my hands, be outside. Then I worked for a restaurant, and I absolutely hated it. I was a dishwasher, made $5.50 an hour. Yeah, yeah. Some of you guys are like, I made less than that uh, back in my day. But it was terrible, right? It's like slave labor, man. And uh, I was a busboy as well, and we had to carry around the dishes, and my back hurt. Uh, and I even played football, and I was, I was worked, man. I was exhausted. I'd go to school, I'd lift after that, and then I'd stay at work until about 11 o'clock. Um, then I worked for another uh, restaurant um, downtown, and I made salads, and it was terrible. Uh, I had probably one of the worst experiences of my life. I was a salad maker, and I had a cut on my hand, and uh, it was on my finger, actually. We got really busy. <laughs> And I put a glove on it, but you know, some of those gloves, they break. And I got really busy, and halfway through the night, my glove broke. And then a little bit longer, I looked down at my hand, and my Band-Aid was gone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was gross. Came back in somebody's salad. I lied. (laughs) I don't know where that came from. 16-year-old. And uh, it was terrible, absolutely terrible. We probably all could share some uh, hor- horrible work stories, um, you know, from our, our previous life and, uh, or even now. And some of you may absolutely hate your job. And it's understandable because a lot of us have some really tough jobs with a lot of worldly people. And working uh, out in the secular environment isn't the easiest thing to do. You're working with all different types of people, all different types of personalities and religious beliefs. And it can be very tough, can't it? Uh, There's some statistics I want to share with you. 63% of people are unhappy with their jobs and just walk through the motions. 18% of Americans hate, loathe their jobs. That means if there's 300 people here this morning, right, one out of every five, basically one out of every five people absolutely hate their job, right? Do not want to go. That's, that's, to me, that's pretty high because... You know, you go into the workforce, it should be something that you are passionate about, that you want to do. 90% of workers worldwide feel that their job is a source of frustration rather than fulfillment. And let's face it, we, for most of us, spend more time at our job than we do with our own family. You get up, you leave, you come home, you got two to three hours together, and then you're going to bed. And so we as a Christian have to understand and really approach our workplace like the scriptures tell us. And the Bible is full. The Bible is full of commands. And we could probably spend a whole series on what the Bible has to say about working and what the Bible has to say about being an employer or what the Bible has to say about being an employee. But tonight, or tonight, today, specifically, I'm tired. Today, specifically, we're going to look at being set free in the workplace, right? to release the burdens of unhappiness and misery and the challenges that you face. We're going to look at what the Bible has to teach us and say about what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus as you work. I worked at a company called White Properties when I was 19 years old. I was in Bible college. And unfortunately, as a, uh, a fairly young Christian, um, somebody who was wanting to study in the ministry, I made a lot of mistakes. In fact, uh, it just finally exploded We had to write these daily reports, and I was getting sick and tired of how I was being treated because I didn't like what people were saying or doing to me. Um, There was this guy named Cook, and he would smoke cigarettes in the workhouse with, like, a lot of paper, and he would just get by with it, and I had to smell the cigarette smoke, couldn't stand it, and so I was angry about that. And then one of my friends there, his name was Chris, and we were building up this scaffolding, and I made a mistake, and he yelled at me, and he said, have at it, Rick, have at it, and he threw his hammer down, and he stormed off. Uh, the president of the company was totally incompetent and uh, w- what I felt as a nine year, 19 year old, okay? I knew everything at that time, don't forget. Uh, I was just so frustrated. And so, you know, everything was going wrong that day. And so I wrote my little report and I stormed out and I said, so and so did this and so and so did that. And uh, I gave an ultimatum to the boss. I said, you can either change my schedule or I quit. And he said, I accept your resignation. <laughs> I thought I was so important, right? He's like, no problem. I wanted to get rid of you anyways. <laughs> but it's, it's tough. I made a lot of mistakes at that job. I let my holiness factor go down. In fact, one of the guys that would work there, and he was trying to be nice, he was like, dude, you're just one of those worldly ministers. I was like, whoa, I have really lost myself, right? To be called a worldly minister, I don't think of a, a worse insult that you could possibly get. 
And he didn't realize what he was saying, but God used him to speak the truth to me in that moment. And my eyes opened. Wow, I have really have to approach how I work and what I do a lot differently. We all make mistakes. Perfection isn't possible. But we should strive to live in such a way that reflects a Christ-centered, kingdom-minded, holy follower of Christ. And that's what Paul says here in Colossians chapter 3. So look at verse 22 with me. He says, slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who are merely pleasing men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of wrong for which he has done, and without partiality. You know, the Bible often describes circumstances or situations and how the Christians should respond. And unfortunately, a lot of people take that as God prescribing or condoning or approving certain aspects that were to the known world then, like the slave master position. But that's simply not the case. Often the Bible would say, you who are Christians and are in this circumstance, here's how you should respond. Not God approving slavery or God approving um, people who trade men for a living. And so this master um, employer type of dynamic, Paul was saying for those of you who are in this slave position, right? And he actually goes on to describe the master position as well. He says this is how you should act. And a lot of people have a misunderstanding about slavery. Slavery, for the most part, wasn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, often people would sell themselves to a certain household because otherwise they would starve. They wouldn't be able to provide for their children. And slavery sometimes would have such a high regard that those who were good slaves um, would actually be adopted into the family and have the same inheritance as a blood relative. And the Bible has a lot to say about how a slave should act and how a master should act. And this morning we're going to look at the response of those who work for someone else. Because ultimately, Paul says, we all work for God. And that's really where we're going to be getting to. But Paul looks at this social structure as he found it. And he was endeavoring to show how the Christian can live at peace. He says, I want the slave to serve wholeheartedly with all of their heart. And he, he addresses them, right? If you look out throughout the, the New Testament, he addresses slaves and masters with equal moral value. You are not lesser of a person because you work for somebody else, is what Paul is actually alluding to. And so there are three things that we're going to talk about today. And here's the first thing, is that our workplace provides a place of conflict against our sinful nature. Our workplace provides a place of conflict against our sinful nature. He says, I want you to obey those who are your masters on earth. Now, of course, we need to clarify, right? We can't just obey our masters and if they tell us to do something that's against our uh, New Testament Christianity or against ethics or things of that nature. But in as, in as much as what it goes to be an employee, the Bible says you need to obey those who are over you when, when you work for them. And that's tough. And the reason why that's tough is because like a 19-year-old working for a company called White Properties, is it's tough because we want to be our own boss. We want to do our own thing. We want to be our own lords. There's a reason why we show up late for work. Or there's a reason why we have to leave early. Or there's a reason why that task didn't get done the way it should have gotten done. And we don't like to be held accountable. And that's what authority does. You see, accountability, a lot of people don't like it. But accountability is simply this. Holding people to what they promised. Right? Isn't that accountability? And we don't like that. Why? Because we mess up. We break our promises. We are creatures uh, who sin. And so this idea of in the workplace, God lets us be confronted with our selfishness and with our own sin. And so the workforce is actually a wonderful environment to be sanctified in Christ. It helps us. It moves us in the direction to, to walk closer with the Lord. And I'll explain what I mean by that. He gives this word obey. Obey means this. It means to obey what is heard. To really listen to the one speaking. To be fully compliant. It is the idea to allow one to be captivated by or to be governed by. That you are submitting yourself to this person and their standards and their way of life and how they want to do things. And the reason why people reject authority in the workplace is because it does confront us with our egocentric way of life, our entitlement that we all feel. And look, 
I am not preaching to the choir here. I am, I am guilty of this as well. Um, even in my place of the past and in the future, there are things that I want done my way. And I have to take a step back and I have to say, hey, am I here to please me or am I here to please God? And that's, if we were all honest with ourselves, I think we could all say that, that that is true. We confront ourselves with what we want and with what we want to do. But as Christians, right, as Christians, our first question should be, what does the Bible say? What does God want? What is the Lord's will for this activity? What is the Lord's will for this structure? What is the Lord's will for this ministry? Not, I wonder what I can do to be great. And if we had that type of attitude and we took that with our jobs, we would do great things for God. Because when we start asking ourselves the question, what does God want me to do? What is the Lord's will in this position? We become more holy. We start doing and saying and thinking as God wants us to. He says, I want you to obey. I want you to follow them. And he says, not with eye service, if you'll notice in verse 22. Not with external service. This means the service that is performed only under the master's eye. And that is not true service. The only time you do your job is when somebody's looking. The only time you do your job is when somebody's watching. He says, this is not what you should do. You see, the absence of a master often encourages laziness. Right, And we do live in a lazy culture that, you know, the difference between American uh, workforce and a lot of places around, around the world is that we are selfish. We do think about our own individuality and how we can stand out. We'll say this, I want to change the world and I want everyone to see me leading the change right? Because we want change, we want to do great things, but we want to be recognized for it and appreciated for it. But often, unfortunately, when the master isn't there to recognize us, um, Paul says you can slip into bad habits. And the Bible, Proverbs, has so much to say about laziness and the dangers of laziness. Let me share a few verses with you. Proverbs 18, 9. He who is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. You see, when we're lazy, when we're slack in our work, we destroy the people around us, and it actually makes it easier to cause more destruction. We live in a very entitled society. Everybody wants something for nothing. Everybody wants something that is free, that is socialism, that is communism, and that is not found in the Bible. The Bible was filled with things like what you reap is what you sow. If you do not work, you do not eat. A man shall eat his own bread. And we're going to read some of those verses a little bit later on. But it, it's destructive. Laziness is destructive. Look at Proverbs 10, 26 up on the screen. He says, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy one to those who send him. You see, vinegar to the teeth, it's acid, right? We find acid in coffee and our sodas, and it, it breaks down the enamel, and it actually causes decay um, much easier. So if you don't keep brushing, if you don't keep flossing, decay will happen at a, at a faster rate. Why? Because the teeth are broken down. And that's what laziness does to the people who employ us, right? It makes decay and destruction a whole lot easier. And if we're not careful... We can cause hurt and pain, even though it's not intentional. He says it's like smoke to the eyes, which actually causes blindness. You can no longer even see to do the right thing, right? Laziness only narrows your focus in on what you want and what you think. And that's why laziness can be so dangerous. He says, I don't want you to be men pleasers. I don't want you to be those who simply seek to please men. He says, but as sincere followers of the Lord. Here's what sincerity means. And you can write this in a note next to this scripture. Sincerity means mental honesty. To be free from hypocrisy and pretense. Not to be self-seeking. That's what sincerity of heart means. You're not doing this job because you can think, man, what can I get out of this? Right? And that's the selfish mindset. He says, I don't want you to court the favor of men. I don't want you to be men pleasers. It's a sickness. Here's what to be a man pleaser is. It is to render service to men as opposed to God, right? Think of it like this, dishonest gain. It's telling a lie for the sake of financial gain, right? You're in opposition to God because pleasing men, meeting your quota, doing what's best for the company is more important than honoring God. And that's, that's what this danger causes us, is that laziness and seeking to please men and not working for the Lord in our jobs makes us, more lizard, makes us more miserable. It causes destruction. 
And so God wants us to be honest. He wants us to work in such a way that honor and pleases him. And here's what's so amazing, is that when we do that, when we are at school, on our sports team, at our place of employment, working for the church, and whatever avenue that we're doing, when we work as if we're working for the Lord, we are set free from the anxiety and the hurt and the disappointment and the self-entitled uh, way of life. And we can be happy again. And that's what's so destructive about working for ourselves and the sense of being a men pleaser and seeking our own happiness is that it only makes things worse. So what Paul was saying here is that if you want to be set free from the burden and the ways of life in the workplace, workplace, start working for the Lord. Start viewing it as I'm here to serve God. Look what Ephesians chapter 6 verses 5 through 8 says. Paul says some of the same things here. He says, slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. So there is, should be a certain reverence for those in authority in our workplace. He says, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service, as men pleasers, but as what? Slaves to Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. You see, he says, I want you to work like you're working for me. I want you to work, God's saying. I want you to work at this job like I'm your boss because ultimately I am. And unfortunately, people, like, they, they approach Christianity uh, or their way of life like Burger King, right? Have it your way. People will go into hours of discussions about things, whether in the church or in the workforce, saying, this is what I want, this is what I need, this is what I think will be best. But yet, God is saying, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to live. Your life is not about pleasing yourself or the people around you. Your life is about bringing glory to me. And that's what the workplace serves as. Not only as a place to confront uh, the conflict of our sinful nature, but it's, it's an amazing opportunity to draw nearer to Christ. You see, our entire Christian lifestyle can serve as an indicator for what's going on in the workforce. And I don't want you to, to walk away here thinking, wow, the work is everything. My, my job is everything. And as you're going to see, it's not. But here's what we can do. We can look at how we work, our attitudes and our actions, and we can see how we work with our attitudes and actions in the workplace as an indicator of a greater picture. This is really about more than just working for an employer. This is about our relationship with God. And so if we are self-seeking and selfish in our workforce, that can probably be an indicator that something bigger is going on in our own life and how we follow Jesus. And it's something that we should all evaluate and look for because if you can work for the Lord in, in your job, you can work for the Lord in every avenue of your life with your family, with your friends, with your community. You see, my job as a minister is to please God first and foremost. And that's an easy illustration. But it's not easy, uh, to say the least. You see, my job is to minister to the gospel, and I have to be honest with people at the cost of attendees, membership, growth, tithing. There was a family who was attending here last year. They wanted to become members here at Severn Christian Church, so I went and talked with them about what it means to be a member in the kingdom, and uh, I, taught, I walked them through what we believe the Bible says uh, and, and simply read scripture. And this is what we believe. I walked them through the plan of salvation, how you have to place your faith into Christ and repent to turn away from your sins. And the Bible says when you're baptized into Christ, Acts 2.38, you are forgiven and you get the Holy Spirit and then you should live faithfully. And they had a problem with the plan of salvation. And I hated it. I hated to see them go. But at the end of the day, my conscience is clear. I can walk away saying that I honored God and I did what was right according to what I believed to be true. And that serves as an illustration for a bigger picture for you and your workplace is that can you walk away with a clear conscience? Can you say that I was honest? I did the right thing when no one was looking. I followed God no matter what. You see, ultimately, we have to understand that we are not working for ourselves or for our bosses or for our companies. We are working for the Lord. We have a heavenly father who watches us, who sees us, who views everything that we do. Paul put it like this in Galatians 1. He says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? 
If I were still trying to please men, I would, be, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And here's the danger of living our lives to please men, is that being a man pleaser can invalidate our service position in Christ. And so that's why looking at how we work and what we do, it, it's an indicator of a bigger picture. Is Jesus Lord of our life? Is he the king in our heart? And this conflict that takes place at your job is pointing you and urging you and challenging you to get serious about following God. And so the key idea is simply this, is that our jobs provoke our sanctification, which causes us to become holier and more like Christ. It urges us and moves us to be like Jesus. Paul put it like this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He says, when I was with you, we used to give you this order If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies, gossips. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. You see, what you do and how you work and the decisions that you make, as you can see, is an indicator of a much bigger picture. It confronts our idols, whether that's our own selfishness, our own laziness, gossip, money, socialism, wanting everything to be free. It really, really does. And so I ask you this morning, will you start to view your employment or your volunteer service or your schoolwork or your activities as if you're serving for the Lord and start to ask yourself, am I honoring God with what I do? You see, these jobs that we have, they're opportunities, they're platforms to not only work for the Lord, but our second point this morning is to reflect a Christ-centered life. Here's the cool thing. The majority of us in here, we work. Everyone lives next to someone. We are all involved involved in some capacity, whether that's volunteering at the church or in school. And so this is a universal principle that we have an opportunity to reflect a Christ-centered life, to show Jesus to people who do not believe and do not know the Lord. He goes on to say in verse 23 of Colossians 3, he says, whatever you do, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for man knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Man, we can work some messed up jobs that are not fun or enjoyable with some messed up people that are not fun or enjoyable, but we are working and serving Jesus. And that is a radical difference to what we, most of us were taught to understand about our jobs. Here are five things about a Christ-centered life that I'd like for you to uh, take with you this morning. Number one, our Christ-centered life at work refocuses our ultimate motivation, which is Christ. You see, if you take a job for $5.50 an hour, your job is for $5.50 an hour. But if you take a job to serve the Lord, wow, how radically different that is. I'm here to serve God. Money isn't necessarily my motivation. Money isn't my idol. I'm not going to be dictated by whether or not my pay is high or low. I'm here to serve God. And of course, we all should ask for what we deserve. Of course, we all should try to get the best paying job we possibly can to provide for our kingdom uh, with Christ, to provide for our family, and, and to make things according to the Lord's will. But we shouldn't let our pay scale determine whether or not we're a Christ follower. Number two, a Christ-centered life at work helps overcome the inner struggle of unhappiness and brings glory to God. Man, when we're working for the Lord, all of a sudden, all the problems that we have, they disappear with how we respond to them, with how we take them, with how we perceive them. And look, the workplace can be extremely tough and, and draining and discouraging, but when you change your mindset, God begins to work because he's at the center Peter, when he was writing to the Christians, he was trying to encourage them. And he said said this, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Dude, this is tough. (laughs) You expect me to work for somebody who is an unreasonable scoundrel who doesn't do his job? I was talking with a friend the other day, and he had the worst administrator you could possibly imagine. Um, and the only reason why he was the administrator, because he was in you know, the, the Navy, the only reason why he was the administrator in the, in the top was because he went there the longest. That was, that was it. He was there the longest. 
didn't do anything. And he was talking about how frustrating it was to work for somebody that was so unreasonable. Uh, and I think we could probably all identify with that, right? To work for somebody that is unreasonable. And Peter says, look, I want you to do your best because you're serving God, not them. He goes on to say, look at this. For this finds favor for if the sake of the conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure, for this finds favor with God. No matter what, when you do the right thing, God is on your side. God is glorified. A Christ-centered life helps you pledge through the unhappiness and the misery of work, and it brings joy back because I'm here to serve you, Lord. Number three, a Christ-centered life helps work the outer witness of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is Lord. You see, it really does matter how we work and why we work because God's reputation is on the line. When Paul was writing to Timothy, he put it like this. All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. And here's the reason. So that the name of our God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. When we're working on our job, God's reputation is on the line. The picture is much bigger than what we go through as individuals. It reflects God. It reflects New Testament Christianity. How many people, like me as a 19-year-old boy working for a company that lived as a heathen, really, that did not follow God, how many people have been turned away from following Jesus because of the immoral actions and ethics of Christians in the workplace? How many people have been turned away from God because they say, man, I thought that guy was a Christian. I thought that guy was a follower of Jesus. And look at him. Look at what she's doing. You see, we have a reputation on the line, and it's not our own. It's God's. It's Christianity. And then finally, a Christ-centered life reminds us that our job is a means to ministry. You see, you don't just work to have nice stuff. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who's in need. You see, our job should be providing a kingdom impact. We should be providing and helping with people who are in need, who are legitimately in need. So we should practice Christian integrity in the workplace because God's reputation is on the line. And here's something that is encouraging. You may not be able to read the gospel at your job or in your classroom. You may not be able to hand out gospel tracts and sermons or, or whatever you would find that you could hand out, but you can show the gospel to your coworkers. You can show the gospel through your lifestyle, your attitude, your work ethic, and you can point to the cross. And that's what Paul says in Colossians 3 and 25. He says, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and with that, without partiality. You see, when we're in the workplace and we're honoring God and we're following God, it points to something much bigger than ourselves, and that's the cross. You see, the cross serves as a constant reminder. God has judged and God will judge. All masters, owners, bosses, employers have a responsibility, but they have a master themselves who will hold them accountable. Maybe you've been cheated. Maybe you've been discriminated against. Maybe you've been pushed out. Maybe you've been taken advantage of. There will be a reckoning one day. God will make all wrongs right. He is sitting on the throne. And so here's a question I have for you that may bring this all together. If you are a master or an overseer of employees, would you want God to treat you like you treat your employees? The Bible says you will be judged according to the measure that you judge other people. Here's another question. If you're an employee, maybe you're on the other side, would you want God to honor and serve you the same way you honor and serve your employer? Do you want God to cheat you out of time? Do you want God to manipulate the system? I don't think anybody wants that. So let us serve in such a way that we want God to treat us and honor us. You see, if God is the ultimate master and the judge, he will hold everyone accountable, including ourselves. The Bible says all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Governments, employers, church leaders, family leaders. 
And I think being abused in the workforce is probably one of the most hurtful things that you could ever endure. It's, it's a violation of who we are. It wages war against your spiritual nature. It seeks to destroy the joy that we have in the Lord. Being abused at your job is a terrible thing. And so if you feel discouraged, let down, forsaken, hard-pressed, taken advantage of, there is a message that you should take with you this morning. Don't give up and serve the Lord. Don't give up and serve the Lord. And so our final point is simply this. The unavoidable judgment provides clarity of our accountability and perspective about our jobs and our money. God will judge. He will make the wrong things right. He will hold us all accountable. But what we do here now in the present has the ability to set us free from everything that weighs everyone down. And I think we've all been there at one point or another. And so we think the answer is to hop to a different job, which sometimes it is. We think the answer is to change the environment, which sometimes it is. But I think ultimately, the answer is this. If you want to be set free from the burdens and the worries that you carry with you in life, start following and serving Jesus. James is one of my favorite books. I encourage everybody, if, if you're struggling to find out what to read in the Bible, man, start with James. James is so encouraging, but also challenging. And James said in, in, in chapter 5, James was talking to some Christians who were going through some pretty challenging stuff, and, um, and he, these Christians were being taken advantage of by rich people, manipulating the system. We don't know what that's like, right? He says in verse 1, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. It's like he's looking for the future. You think what you have now is going to last? You think what you have now and your abusive people is going to be forgotten about? Oh no, these things are going to disappear. He says in verse three, your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in these last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed in your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. Those of you who have been unjust to others, they will judge you. He says, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord. God knows what you go through when you suffer. God knows what you go through when times are tough and you can't make ends meet and you're working and you're serving and you feel like you can't get ahead. He says in verse five, you've lived in luxury on earth and led the life of wanton pleasure. You fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and put to death the righteous man, and he doesn't resist you. And here's the encouragement, he says in verse 7. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the late rains. You, too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another. The last thing the church should do is to turn to each other and complain for the problems that we face in the world. He says, so that you yourselves may not be judged, but behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. He says, we count them blessed for what they endured. He says, you have heard about the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Mercy and compassion will win. God will hold people accountable for the injustice. The day is coming. Do not give up. Do not lose heart. Keep pressing on. So I want you to think about your job and your workplace as an opportunity for the glory of God to be revealed. I want you to think about your workplace as an opportunity to point to the cross. Most of the Psalms were born in difficulty. Most of the epistles were written from prisons. Most of the greatest thoughts of the greatest thinkers of all time had to pass through the fire. And when we think about this time of communion that we're getting ready to take, the darkest moment in history produced the greatest outcome for the entire world throughout all time. And that was the sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross. That he broke his body, he shed his blood, that we might live. And so if you're in a dark moment now, if the dark moment is yet ahead 
do not give up. Do not forsake God. Do not back down. Because sometimes God's greatest work is in the most challenging and darkest of times. And it was the darkness of the cross that made the light of the resurrection possible. It is because Jesus lives that we can get up, we can face tomorrow, we can go to work, we can attend school, we can deal with our families. And that's what the Lord's Supper reminds us of. It points towards the resurrection and a better tomorrow. It reminds us of the forgiveness and the compassion and the mercy of God that he took our own punishment. And so they're going to pass around this uh, cup that is Jesus' blood. They're going to pass around this loaf that is Jesus' body. And as that, that bread breaks between your teeth and as that, that juice is poured down your mouth, I want you to think about and remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave. That no matter what situation we face, we have forgiveness for a better tomorrow. The resurrection is coming. The day of judgment is coming. But Jesus offers us our forgiveness and hope now. Let's pray. God, thanks for sending your son to die for us. And as we take your bread, which is your body, and the cup, which is your blood, Lord, I pray that we'll get rid of all the distractions from work. We'll get rid of all the distractions from our shortcomings and our failures. And we'll remember that Jesus broke his body for us and that he died for us. And as your word says, we're proclaiming your death until you come again, Lord. Thank you for sending your son on the cross to die for our sins, God. Thank you for loving us enough to sacrifice everything, to endure the darkness, that we could have hope and joy and be set free in every avenue of our life, Lord, to serve you. So, Father, we thank you. We ask you for a spiritual strengthening. We ask you for a spiritual motivation that we can face this next week with the hope and the joy knowing that you reign and that we serve you and that we follow you. God, I pray for this body. I pray for this church. And I pray that we'll continue to view our lives as slaves and followers of you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name.